Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on testing the assumptions for Pearson's R in SPSS. As always, if you find this video useful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I certainly appreciate it. I have here in the statistics data editor in SPSS fictitious data I'll be using for this example. I have four variables here, depression, anxiety, motivation, and aptitude. And let's assume that all these are recorded as T-scores, a standard score with a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. It's worth noting that these variables do not need to contain standard scores in order to calculate a correlation coefficient. And for that matter, the units of analysis from variable to variable do not have to be the same either. So the scores do not have to be standardized and you can have different units of analysis. So let's say that we want to calculate Pearson's R, which is one type of correlation coefficient, the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. We want to calculate Pearson's R between all the pairs of variables here. So between depression and anxiety, depression and motivation, all the possible pairs. In this situation, when we are contemplating running a correlation as it relates to learning statistics and using statistics to answer research questions, I find a good number of times that assumptions are not tested. And I think there are a few reasons for that. I think one reason is that the correlation coefficient is considered a fairly simple statistic compared to linear regression or ANOVA, and it just doesn't occur to those who are considering calculating a correlation coefficient that it has assumptions as well. I believe another reason is that it's unusual to design a research question that's answered by a correlation coefficient like Pearson's R. Usually we design research questions that are more complex that would require a linear regression in order to answer the question or an ANOVA. And sometimes if our data do not meet the assumptions for more complex statistics, we end up running a correlation to try to salvage something from the data. So either we don't get a result uh, that we wanted from linear regression, for example. So we look to the correlation coefficient to give us something useful, some information uh, from from the analysis from the correlation coefficient that we can use and under those circumstances it becomes easy to forget to carry out any type of assumption testing so what are the assumptions for Pearson's R well we want to look at the level of measurement for each of the variables that we're going to be using in the calculation we don't want there to be outliers and we're looking for each variable to be normally distributed. And we also want to test for homoscedasticity and linearity. So let's first take a look at the level of measurement assumption. And I'm going to move over here to the variable view on the bottom left. And you can see that the measure column in the variable view here for all four of these variables is scale. Now SPSS doesn't have a way to specify a level of measurement other than scale, ordinal, or nominal. So the interval and ratio are combined and both of those are referred to as scale. For Pearson's R, for Pearson correlation, the variables need to be either at the interval or ratio level. And here of course, as I mentioned, that just becomes coded as scale. So all four of these variables are scale, so we met the assumption for the level of measurement. Next we want to check for normality, and we want to make sure there are no outliers. And we're going to use the same process to test both of those assumptions. It's going to be analyze, descriptive statistics, and explore. This explore function, we can answer both of those questions using this. So I'm going to move all four variables over to the dependent list list box. And then moving to the top right under statistics, 
descriptives is checked off by default. We can also check off outliers here as well. Click continue. Over to plots. I'm going to uncheck stem and leaf. We're not going to need that here, but I'm going to check off histogram and check off normality plots with tests. And there's no changes here under options. So we have the explore function configured. Click OK. And we can see we have the case processing summary. We have no missing values here. The descriptives for depression, anxiety, aptitude, and motivation. And of particular interest here, looking at testing normality, would be the skewness value. And there are a number of guidelines for what's acceptable for the skewness value. And we're going to take this information and combine it with other information in this output. Uh, one guideline that seems fairly popular is the skewness should be negative between negative 1 and 1 or negative 0.8 and 0.8. So either way here for depression, using either set of guidelines, the skewness value is in that range. Anxiety, same thing. Moving down to aptitude, uh, by one set of guidelines, this aptitude variable would be outside that range and by another set of guidelines inside and for motivation 0 0.027 would be inside both sets of guidelines. The next table is the extreme values table and this can be helpful especially with large data sets we want to see what the highest and lowest values are. I'm going to be looking at outliers using the box plot which is down a little bit in this output. Next we have the tests of normality. So here again this is information we're going to combine with the skewness information and we're going to be using the Shapiro-Wilk test. We have the probability value for Shapiro-Wilk here in this right column. So for depression it's 0.483, anxiety 0.348 neither one of those values are statistically significant and for aptitude 0 0.012 and for motivation 0 0.03 both of those probability values are statistically significant. So the Shapiro-Wilk test tests the null hypothesis that the variable is sampled from a normal distribution. So if we have a non-statistically significant result as we have for depression and anxiety we would assume that these two variables are approximately normally distributed. And if we have statistical significance, as we do in the case of aptitude and motivation, we would say that these variables are not normally distributed. Again, we can combine this with the skewness data and we can look at the histogram. And if we look at the histogram for depression, we can see that it mostly appears normally distributed. And moving down to anxiety does not seem to be as good a fit with a normal distribution but you can certainly make an argument that it's close moving down to aptitude and again this variable appears to be normally distributed we do have some higher scores here though and then taking a look at motivation this does not appear to be normally distributed so weighing all this information together, in this case, pro I would probably go with the Shapiro-Wilk results. So we have normality for depression and anxiety, and we violate the assumption of normality for aptitude and motivation. Now moving on to outliers, and again, we can find the outliers right here in the output from Explore. And what we're looking for is any case that's greater than this top whisker here in this box plot for depression, for example, or lower than the bottom whisker. So value down here below this bottom whisker or up here above the top whisker. You can see there's no outliers for depression, no outliers for anxiety. We have four outliers for aptitude and all of them are greater than the highest whisker and what SPSS is reporting here is not the value but the record so it's records 17, 19, 8 and 31 all of those records are 
outliers. So if we look at, for example, record 8, that would be this record here. So this score of 65 is an outlier, as well as the other three records, 17, 19, and 31. We look those up, we'd also find values that are outliers. Moving down to the motivation variable, no outliers here. So in terms of the assumption of no outliers, only the aptitude variable violates that assumption. Now to test the last two assumptions, it's going to be similar to the no outliers and normality in the sense that we're going to be running one test that will provide the output we need to determine if we have linearity or homoscedasticity. And that'll be from graphs. That test will be from the graphs item of the menu and then chart builder. And in this choose from list box, I'm going to select scatter dot and a simple scatter and drag that up to the chart preview area. And I'm not going to run every combination of all of these variables, uh, just a few. So I'm going to take depression, and put that on the y-axis, and anxiety on the x-axis. So let's take a look. So depression and anxiety, simple scatter, click OK. And we can see, looking at these, the relationship between these two variables, that the points in this case generally go from the bottom left to the top right in more or less a straight line. That's what we're looking for when we think about linearity. And I can double click on this. We can add a line here from the chart editor. So we can see that the points do tend to form a straight line. Now it doesn't matter that we start out in the bottom left and end up in the top right. Uh, the relationship could still be linear moving from the top left to the bottom right or if it just goes straight across we're just looking for these points to more or less form a line certainly there's a degree of subjectivity when looking at scatter dots as well as many types of plots we're looking at these data we do appear to meet the assumption of linearity. In this example we're going to assume that we have met the assumption for linearity. However, what would it look like if we violate that assumption? Well, we wouldn't have the points arranged so that we can see a clear line like we have here. So one example would be if we had the points in this bottom left area and as they started to move to the right it bent sharply so the points kind of form bend so we have points down here and they bend sharply up toward the middle and the top of the scatter plot the points form a curve All right that would be a nonlinear relationship another example is if you had the points arranged so they look like a U so they start off in the top left move to the bottom middle and then back up to the top right that would also be a non-linear relationship. When you look at how the points are arranged, if there's curvature, that's not linear. If it's a straight line, you have linearity. From this same scatter plot, we can also look at the assumption of homoscedasticity. And two variables are homoscedastic when the variances are the same at all levels of the value of the variable. So again, we can assess that right from this scatter plot. As we look at these points, say in the bottom left, above and below the line, we can see that the distance to the line is roughly equal as you move all the way through the values of this anxiety variable. We have the same variance it's homoscedastic. So let's take a look at another pairing so we can see what it looks like if we violate the assumption of homoscedasticity. So I'll close this out and go back to the chart builder 
and reset. Again, just move the scatter dot, scatter dot up into the preview area. And this time I'm going to use aptitude and depression. So aptitude on the Y axis, depression on the X axis, and click OK. And again, double click here, I'm going to add that line. And we can see here in this example, we have some deviation from the line here in the bottom left. And here where depression scores around 45, there seems to be the points above the line are similar to the points below the line in terms of how much distance from the points to the line. But as we move to the right, especially where depression is equal to 50 or greater, we can see that we have a lot more variance. We have points farther from the line, farther above the line, and farther below the line. So we would say that we violated the assumption of homoscedasticity in this case. The variances are not the same for every value of this depression variable. So this would be heteroscedastic. So to fully test these assumptions, you would run this chart builder scatter dot for every combination, so for all the pairs of these four variables. And then we could go to analyze and run the correlation. Again, in this instance, uh, some of the assumptions were violated just in what was tested so far. And you may find more violations of the assumptions by running the rest of the variables. We'll go to analyze and correlate by variate just so I can show you how to run the correlation itself, how to calculate the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. So we have these four variables. Again, I'm going to move them over to the variables list box to the right. And by default, Pearson is checked off under the correlation coefficients frame. So I'm going to leave that and no changes under option or style. And click OK. And you can see, we'll just take a look here at this depression variable. Looking at depression and the correlation coefficient, Pearson's R with anxiety 0.881. And that is statistically significant. You can see that here in the second row. For depression motivation, Pearson's R is 0 0.025. That's not statistically significant. The p-value here is 0 0.87. That's greater than 0 0.05. And the Pearson's R between depression and aptitude, 0.488. And that is statistically significant. So when looking at Pearson's R, we know that the correlation is a measure of the strength of association between two variables. So how do we know how strong the association is based on different values of Pearson's R? Again, this depends on what variables you're testing and other circumstances, but there are some general guidelines that indicate a small, medium, or large strength of association. For small, we're looking at a Pearson's R of 0.1 to 0.3 or negative 0.1 to negative 0.3. So in the case of depression and motivation here, we can see we have a value of 0.025. That is below 0.1. So this would not even qualify as a small strength of association. In this instance, we would say there's essentially no association between these two variables. Moving to medium strength of association, the Pearson's R value would be 0.3 to 0.5 or negative 0.3 to negative 0.5. And the depression aptitude relationship falls into that category, 0.488. That would be a medium strength of association. And then large would be 0.5 to 1 or negative 0.5 to negative 1. And we have that here between depression and anxiety, 0.881. I hope you found this video on assumption testing for Pearson's R and SPSS to be helpful. And thanks for watching.